Welcome to this video on the laws of reflection and refraction. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at some geometric principle optics and how we can predict how light will reflect or refract off of a substance when it hits a boundary between two different substances. So if you haven't watched the previous video on index of refraction, you want to check that out because I'm going to refer to that a lot in this video and I'm not necessarily going to explain it again. So when we look here um, at the simulator, which is from vet.colorado.edu, another great simulator they've offered, and uh, a link to it is in the description below, we have to take into account some basic uh, premises in order to use the language for geometric optics, and that is that geometric optics primarily does not visually treat waves as sinusoidal. It treats them, if I turn my laser on here, as geometric rays. This uh, means they originate from some source, they travel in a straight line, and that's a crucial um, assumption that we're making for geometric optics. The electromagnetic rays, it does not have to be visible light, right? This could be a microwave generator rather than a laser, and we should still see basically the same relationships. The electromagnetic rays change direction when they encounter a boundary, and this is the boundary between two different substances, here air and glass. Now I'm going to change the materials here to air and water, which water is about 1.333, and, and we'll use that for most of our experiments today. Rays either reflect, which is that they bounce back into the same medium, or they will refract or bend as they enter the new medium. The angle of incidence is referred to, and that is this angle over here. Now an important thing in geometric optics is that we always measure angles from a, on the normal line or a vertical angle. So we don't measure the angle off of the surface, we measure the angle off of the, um, a line that is normal to the surface. So we would refer to this angle over here as the angle of incidence, and I always think of incoming light, so incident angle. This would be the angle of reflection. And then down here, we have the angle of refraction. And we will often talk about the light bending towards the normal or bending away from the normal as it enters the new substance. So these are some of the assumptions that we will be using and the language we'll be using when we go through this scenario. Now one other thing that I wanted to look at here is the light intensity. So we see here there's a hundred percent intensity uh, coming from this laser. Now when I put the light the, the light intensity mon uh, meter over here I see that about 5.29 percent of the light is bouncing back and the rest of it, 94.71%, is refracting. So we're seeing more of the light is refracting than is reflecting. However, if I make the material, the, the refractive index of the material down here, the material it's hitting, if I make that refractive index higher, I actually see that more of the light reflects than refracts or more of the light reflects than it did before, but still more of it is refracting. Now, if this was completely opaque and none of the light could refract through it, we would have close to 100% reflection. So that's just an interesting thing to think about as we look at these uh, incident, reflected, and refracted rays. So let's start with the angle of reflection. I'm going to turn on the angle measuring tool here so that I can make this a little bit quicker than using the protractor. And what we see is no matter what we change the angle to, the light ray's angle of reflection is always the same as the angle of incidence. So that one's pretty easy. So what we, the way we would notate that here is we would say theta, which is going to represent the angle. So we'd say the angle of incidence is exactly equal to the angle of reflection. Now reflection and refraction start with the same two letters or same three letters. And so hopefully if I switch 
from one to the other, you will uh, be able to tell from context, and I'll try my best not to do that. Okay, no matter what we change the indexes of refraction to, we see that the angle of reflection is going to be the same no matter what. So I'm going to go back here to uh, water again. So we'll put it at 1.333. And what we're going to do is now take a look at the relationship between the angle of incidence, which here is 57.5 degrees, and the angle of refraction. Now, if I were to collect several different combinations, and I'm not going to do all of that right now just to save some time on this video, but if I were to write down the ordered pairs here of the angle of incidence and refraction and then graph those values, I would get the following graph. The line would start to it would increase and they would start to level out and I would start to get a repeat of that same material because I can only ever fluctuate between 0 and 90 degrees. There's not going to be a way for us to create a equation from that unless it has um, a sine and a cosine involved. So what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to make a linearized graph and I'm going to graph the sine of the angle of refraction. So here this stands for refraction and I'm going to graph that against the sine of the angle of incidence. And what I find if I do that now is I get a linear graph. So it is a straight line graph like this. Now we know obviously a linear function has this basic form. Here y is equal to the sine of the angle of refraction. x is equal to the sine of the angle of incidence. And now we need to figure out what the meaning of the slope is. So if you recall from uh, many of the videos we've looked at, we've talked about the fact that the slope is a physical constant. So whatever is constant in the function is going to have something to do with something that was physically constant in the simulator. So if I take a look at what those would be over here, I've got the only other things that I can use in terms of numbers. Let's see, well, it could possibly be the wavelength of the light. That's a number that's measurable. It could be the refractive index of this incident material. It could be the refractive index of this um, refracting material. So let's try to see if we can figure out what it is, or maybe it's a combination of all those things. So to do that, I'm going to actually take a numeric function. So I graphed this on Excel, and this function that I got here was equal to y um, equals point seven, and I'm just going to round this point seven five one um, or seven five zero actually. 750x. Now, obviously y and x mean nothing here, so I'm going to get rid of those, and I'll put in sine theta refraction, and this one sine theta incident. So now what I'm going to do is try to figure out what actually is this number 0.75. So at first glance, it's none of these things. Okay, so I, I might have something here. I didn't have anything to do with the wavelength, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not included here. But if I actually start to look at these, well, it can't be the product of these two numbers because that would be 1.33, but the quotient of 1 divided by 1.333 is 0 0.750 and some change. So it actually comes out to be the index, the slope here, is equal to the index of refraction of the initial substance, so I'm going to call that N1, over the index of refraction of the second substance, which is very interesting. And so what we find then is that this equation actually comes out to be sine theta r, so the angle, the sine of the angle of refraction is equal to index of refraction of the incident material over the index of refraction of the refractive material times the sine of the angle of incidence. Now a lot of times what we see happen is people will actually usually multiply N2 on both sides so we end up with N2 times 
the sine of theta 2, we could say, because it's going into that substance, equals n1 times the sine of theta 1. This is known as Schnell's law, and this is the law that describes the relationship between the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. This is an interesting combination here. Now you can see that not only will the angle of um, incidence affect the angle of refraction, but also the ratio of the refractive indices of the material. So even though when we change this value over here, we see that there is a change, remember that ratio between the two is changing, even if we're just changing one of them. What's also very interesting here is that if I shift the color of the light, so this is changing the wavelength of the electromagnetic ray, I see that the angle of reflection has no response. But the angle of refraction I see is slightly different. It's starting to change a little bit. But at the same time, the refractive index is changing. So that implies that the refractive index of each color here, or of each wavelength, is going to be slightly different. And that's actually very important in this grand scheme. So if we take a look at what the index indices of refraction are, so remember, n is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in that substance. We showed this in the last video that frequency times wavelength and frequency times wavelength. The frequency of the light is not changing, but the wavelength differences will shift. So we see there that if I have a wavelength difference in the different substance, then that's going to cause the index of refraction to change. So if the wavelength of, say, this red light at 700 nanometers is quite a bit different than the wavelength at 380 nanometers for the, the violet light, what we're going to see here is that the index of refraction will be slightly different and so we'll have we could graph all of the lines over here and show the slightly different ratios maybe depending on the different uh, combinations and therefore we would have a different angle as well so in following videos we're going to take a look at what's known as total internal reflection and um, if you didn't notice we were always having the light go from a less dense medium or a refractive index that was lower into one that was higher. But what if we switched it and we made the light go from water now into air? We'll take a look at that in the next video.